We're here to talk about the uh, case study of the District Attorney Juvenile Diversion Initiative in San Diego. And uh, we've been running this program for uh, several years. And we have representatives from the program uh, on this panel. So we have uh, Bria Buskey, who is with the National Conflict Resolution Center. She's the program manager. <laughs> And you can tell already that she's doing an <laughs> excellent job. Uh, and then uh, a longtime partner, uh, Lisa Weinreb, who is the uh, chief of the juvenile division of the district attorney's office in San Diego and has been an amazing partner. And then Monica Felix, who is the supervisor of the behavioral health program of the Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego, one of our community partners. And then uh, Sunny Chang, who is uh, a program manager with Outdoor Outreach, one of our community partners. Uh, this juvenile diversion initiative, as you'll see, uh, involves many uh, staff and community partners, and many of them are here today, so I just want to Welcome all of you and thank you for all of your support in making this program so successful. So I'm gonna uh, start the discussion by uh, asking uh, Lisa uh, about the origin of the DA Juvenile Diversion Initiative and how it came about, how you designed it and what your thought process was around establishing this type of program. Thank you so much, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and to see everyone here. Um, as Steve said, we've had an opportunity to work with NCRC and the restorative justice community for uh, many, many years here in San Diego. We feel very fortunate. I feel like uh, California is very progressive in how we are working with our youth, and even hearing this last panel, and I'm hearing about some of the things that you are having the challenges with with youth, it's mind-boggling to me that those are issues that you're dealing with with youth in these other states. Um, so I also have an opportunity to sit nationally and work with the National District Attorneys Association with Angela, who you heard on your first panel, um, and with the uh, American Bar Association on setting standards for juvenile justice. So we're really trying to make these changes that we're talking about here today on the national level. So rest assured it is coming. I'm sorry it's so slow. Um, but um, again, um, I just, we ha I have learned so much. I've been a prosecutor for 30 years, um, and you met my boss, Summer Stephan, this morning. So you see the innovation comes from the top, and that's very important. And when you have a leader like Summer Stephan, it really gives us the opportunity to really come up with wonderful, innovative programs and to learn and, um, and collaborate with our community partners. So I had the opportunity to work with the Annie E. Casey Foundation, with Georgetown University Center for Juvenile Justice Reform, and our local San Diego Probation Department and juvenile justice partners here. And from those experiences, I have learned so much and took everything I learned from all of that and came back to San Diego and said, we have got to do better. Um, we are fortunate again here that every police agency here diverts youth. So if a youth is arrested by or even contacted, okay, we have to use those, those terms very carefully, contacted by law enforcement, our law enforcement here in California and in San Diego divert lower, lower level misdemeanors. We never see those cases in our office. They do not come to the district attorney's office and that's the way it ought to be. They send them to community-based organizations so that they can do a diversion process. If they're successful and they engage, we never see those cases. But there are those misdemeanors that do come to us and they come to the district attorney's office for filing of charges. So then our probation department under the law has the opportunity as well to divert certain misdemeanors and felonies, depending on their ages and all these things. But we learned from Georgetown University, Annie Casey, juvenile brain development, that there's got to be a better way to not even push these kids anywhere closer to the system than they've already had once they touch law enforcement. So how do we keep them from even having to go to probation? How do we keep them from filing uh, a petition against them and then they get court diversion? I mean, let's try and keep them away from that. We've learned that. So the DA's office, who has the power? We keep hearing it. You know, we're gonna put our money where our mouth is. If we keep saying we wanna help kids, 
We have the money and the power to do it in the DA's office. So we decided to set up this diversion program. Let's put another layer of diversion in here before they even go to probation or before we have to file charges. I don't want to file charges just to get the kids' services. That is absolutely not what to do. So let's divert. So we put out an RFP, right, a, a, um, a call for, um, for people to um, apply for a diversion program. And NCRC was the one that received that contract. The DA's office put money towards this diversion program to have a community organization provide the diversion services. Not the DA's office, not government, not any of that. So the cases that ultimately come to us that didn't um, successfully complete the police diversion or that were, um, police can't legally divert felonies. So they have to come to us. So we are diverting misdemeanors and lower level felonies. So we're doing that. So those cases come to us and we review every single case that is submitted to our office. We look at every one of those cases to see if they are appropriate for diversion. Misdemeanors and lower level felonies will go to diversion. Um, what we will do then is we will send them to NCRC for them to then do an assessment of the youth. They do a risk and resiliency assessment tool. Very important to determine what the youth's needs are and to see what does this youth need. Now the diversion, we don't get detailed information about all, any of the information that's going on with NCRC. We get to find out and Bria and her fabulous team will give us information on are they being successful um, are they engaging? But we're not going to get any details. We don't need that. We just need the community to embrace these kids. We're listening to the community. The community wants these kids back. The community knows what the youth need. The community can wrap around those kids. The youth, the community are more culturally appropriate and competent to provide those services. Um, we are listening and we are trying to, to listen to the community and give those kids back to the community to help them. So we have been sending them to the diversion program, and you're gonna hear a lot from Bria about that. It is no more than six months. If the youth completes it in less than that, then they're, they're done. Um, they have to do a skill building and, um, uh, and a wellness program. Those are the two things, and those are gonna be tied to what their interests are and what their needs are. If they're not high needs, we're not gonna be inundating them with services. We're gonna give them the services that they need. We're watching out for net widening. We're trying not to do that. We worked very closely with the community in building this as well, with our justice partners and with the Annie Casey Foundation, who I must thank, because we really leaned on Scott McDonald. Scott will attest that I would call him all the time and saying, I'm thinking about this, but it's not feeling right. What do you think? And we would, he would really um, be a good sounding board for me and was very helpful. So I thank you um, for all of that. Um, and one thing that I also want to say is we felt, and we've heard a lot about this today, is um, educational advocacy. That was very important in building this program. We made sure that an educational advocate was available because we heard, of course, we know this, if kids are not engaged in school or have barriers in school, idle time, on and on. We know, we know, we know the drill. So we have educational advocates who are available to assist these families and youth to ensure that the schools are providing the services that they need. We have uh, behavioral health. We have uh, all of our amazing partners. We have 100 linked organizations, 40 to 50 subcontracted organizations of CBOs and grassroots organizations so that we're utilizing it. We are pushing funding down to the communities into those grassroots organizations. As part of the contract with NCRC, it was mandated that they take the money, some of the money and subcontract and push that money into community to build up and uplift community so that they can in turn help the kids. Thank you. I, I want to I ask you, Lisa, before the other panelists, I, when we started the program, we were in one community and we were really working on restorative programming around mm -hmm. misdemeanor type diversion. And then when you went to the larger countywide program, you included felonies, low level felonies, what was the impetus for that growth in, in the types of cases that you were open to bringing into this type of program and diversion? So 10 years ago, we began working in the restorative justice space with NCRC and Impact Justice. I know that they're here today. 
Um, and we started in kind of a smaller area of, of, the, of San Diego. And from that, we were learning. I mean, we were evolving together. And it was really a learning opportunity for the DA's office as well. And from then, we got to see the amazing benefits of the diversion programs. And why not expand it? We, we, have, we see these kids going into court, but we know that that's not necessarily what many of these kids need. So that's where we learned from it and, and realized the, the uh, um, amazing opportunities that we have to divert even felonies um, to these diversion programs. Well, thank you. Uh, well, Bria, I, I just also want to mention in the audience, we have uh, Francisco Carbajal, who is the, uh, began as our program manager of the program, and the lessons learned from him were passed on to Bria, and so I just want to acknowledge that. Thank you, Paco. Uh, so, uh, so Bria, you're uh, managing this team, and it's a pretty big team, so can you explain a little bit about how it's set up and what the role of NCRC is and our community providers? Yeah, so pretty much Lisa kind of gave the brief rundown of some of the requirements for the program, but what happens is they send over all these kiddos to us, misdemeanors, felonies, all these different things going on in their lives. We reach out to the families. The DA does not reach out to them first. We bring them in and then we're trying to gauge immediately what's going on with this kid. How did we get here? We're less concerned about the charge that's attached to them and why they're committing these charges, right? We need to focus on the underlying issues. So once we have these kids enrolled and their families are buying into the program, right? Because that's a challenge within itself is to get these families to really want to trust in us as the administrator of the DA's program, right? It's the DA's program. And a lot of our families that come in, they don't trust systems. And so now we're immediately trying to build this relationship and this rapport with this family who has not had a good experience. And then once they are bought in, they're all enrolled, then yes, we do an assessment. And the assessment is to show us what are the highest needs of this youth? What do we need to provide while this kid is in our program? But more so for our team, we're trying to understand, besides what the assessment is showing us, what is the kid telling us, right? Are we really listening to what this kid is saying to us and what the parent is telling us is needed for this kid to be successful? And based on that, we're sitting down with this kid and we're coming up with a case plan. And that's how we're deciding what's gonna be required. What are their strengths? What are they interested in? What are they gonna commit to without being told you have to do this or else you're gonna get sent back and you're gonna have your charges tied to you forever? Cause that doesn't work, we've seen it. And once that's done, we really are just connecting these youth to these community organizations, like the woman that you just heard on that panel, who are doing the work, who have been doing the work, who have invested their time and their years in understanding the communities that they're serving. And of course, if we have people harmed or victims, right, attached to these cases, that's where we're tying in the restorative practices and we're bringing everyone together in a circle or in some type of a space to really repair that harm. Let's get it all on the table. Let's talk about how the kid got here. How were you impacted and how can everyone move forward and try not to be back in these type of situations again. And of course, the kicker of it all, you know, if the kid is successful, they go through everything they need to do with all of our support the charge disappears, the charges drop, their record is sealed and they can start over again. And it's really important for NCRC to make these connections and identify these partners that are in these youth community so when they finish JDI, we can hand them back, right? And they can know, you still have us, you can call us, you can reach out, don't come back to the program, but you can reach out, <laughs> we're here to support you, but these people are here for you, there's mentors that are down the block that they may not have known were there until they got sent here. And we try to pitch it, you know, it's a blessing in disguise for a lot of these youth because they would have never got the services that they deserve and that they really needed if they weren't sent to this program. Could you just describe a little bit of the scope of the management, like who's on your team up from NCRC? Of course, so I have a great team. Um, I have a community and engagement and outreach manager who's sitting right here up in the front who is number one in identifying all of our wonderful community partners and service providers to bring these services to our youth. I have six case managers who are really like the front runners. They're the ones who get the kiddos. Yes. Um, and are doing the work and really trying to understand and gain this rapport with the kids and connect them to these services that they need and that they want, right? Sometimes they don't even know. They're like, oh, I don't know what I'm interested in. And the case manager pulls and pulls and pulls. And they're like, yeah, you should try this. And like, just get them to try something new. I have two case coordinators who essentially do half admin and half 
support the youth and the case managers, right? So they're hitting up the families, they're reaching out to subcontractors, they are making sure kids are getting transportation, they're where they're supposed to be, making sure case managers who have 30 plus kids are really supported and having that extra set of eyes and hands to really assist these kids on their journey. I have an administrative assistant who's awesome, she's brand new, she is my number one translator. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's great with our Spanish-speaking families because we are in San Diego, right? And we know that that can be a major barrier if the cultural competence and understanding is not there. And so she does a great job of looping all of that together and just having these families really understand, you know, this is why we're here. And like, this is, it's, we're gonna help you. Like, this is not just, oh, we're just here to get money and look at numbers. Like, none of my team is here for that. Um, <clears throat> Who am I forgetting? I have an outreach and victim engagement coordinator who, she might look familiar to some of you guys. She was one of our peacemakers a couple of years back and had her team at our peacemaker event this year. So she is really working side by side with our case managers to reach out to the people harmed in these cases and just be their advocate, right? Like, what do you really need? And our case managers are working all their time so hard and dedicated with these kids, but she's really there to build the bridge of, you know, I understand, you know, we're gonna be, so protective of our youth, but she's there to have everyone looped in of like, okay, these people were harmed and this is what they need. And so I understand where your kid is coming from, what your kid is going through, but this family was impacted this way and this is what we have to do for everyone to move forward. I have a contract administrative coordinator, <laughs> better known as my right hand, right? Um, she's great, she works with all of our partners and our entire team to keep our contracts in order, make sure everyone is doing what they need to do, everyone is held accountable, um, and that our providers and our team are all aligned and on the same page. Did I forget anyone? So I, I, I bring that up, I raise that question just to give you a sense of how complex and elaborate, you know, the management of a program like this is, and I, I think there's the case managers and the key position with the community connector, how important it is to reach out into the community to have this sense of, of, of community engagement to guide youth in the right uh, direction. And when we first started the program years ago, it was a restorative justice focused sort of victim offender type program. And all of a sudden we have the Rady Children's Hospital from the health sector in the program and it's this sort of matching of human health, health and human services and the justice system all under the umbrella of the same program. So Monica, I'm just curious with the Rady Children's Hospital, the major uh, hospital for youth in this region, how are you involved in this program and, and why? Yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Monica. I'm one of the licensed clinical social workers at Rady Children's Hospital, one of the supervisors who directly oversees our behavioral health programs um, at the main campus and also at our behavioral health urgent care, which is a clinic here in Mid-City, so some of you guys may know of it, but at the behavioral health urgent care, we're a pretty small team. We have an admin, two mastered level clinicians, and a small team of psychiatrists. And we partner with NCRC to provide mental health services, um, specifically short-term, um, sessions and therapy to these kiddos. So these short-term care is anywhere from four to six sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and we also can support with medication evaluation as well. Um, we know that they are, we ha we're in a mental health crisis right now, and we often see youth who are in crisis and who are in need of these supports. And so we are referred these families not only from NCRC, but throughout the community. We also have our walk-in hours, which are for crisis intervention, or crisis assessments, I'm sorry. Um, crisis and risk assessments for any youth who are coming in presenting for um, suicidal ideation, any thoughts of self-harm. We try to get them connected to services because there is a lot of youth who are in need of help and are just having a really difficult time getting connected to mental health agencies. Um, a lot of community programs have really long wait lists and are unable to get in. And so we try to bridge that gap in providing these short-term services. Great. And then, uh, Sunny, you're working with Outdoor Outreach and, and what is that organization, what do you bring to the program for the youth? Yeah, um, hello everybody. Sunny, 
from Outdoor Outreach. Well, we're a local nonprofit started back in 1999. And how we started was just from our founder's garage. <laughs> he had five surfboards. He started taking the local youth out. And uh, the, the foundation is that on the surface, we are taking youth outdoors to go surfing, rock climbing, kayaking, stand-up paddle boarding, all of these different activities that perhaps they may not have an opportunity to on their own, through their family, or even through their community. Uh, but that's just the surface level, right? So then underneath that, what really is happening is that they are building connections. They're building connections with their peers as they go through this activity. They're building connections with the staff, our staff members, and CRC staff members when they get to see Bria or any of their uh, folks out there on a kayak, you know, they get to be in the boat together. So they're building these relationships and these connections to peers, mentors, um, the environment. So ultimately, it's this sense of belonging. We talk about sense of belonging, how important that is. And so through these activities, there's so much gained from that, as well as just personal um, resilience building, right, confidence building, the idea that I can do this. And then even beyond that, representation. <laughs> we talk about these sports and, you know, we often have these conversations, the more in-depth conversations with our youth. And when we mention a rock climber, a surfer, do they picture themselves in that space? And often you don't because you don't see the representation on magazines, in our movies and social media. And so we are changing that. The space does belong to our youth. The space, we're, we're trying to make it that this is your home. Well, I think it was Marquita. Who, whose house? Our house. Like, it, this really is it. And so through this work where we may attract them in through this very really fun, and it really is, right? Physical activity is also very important. And then beyond that, we're, we're touching upon mental health. We're touching upon communication skills, resilience building. Um, to address a lot of what we're seeing here and what we're trying to prevent, uh, which is recidivism and coming back into the system. So all of that work kind of ties in and super grateful, super help, happy to have this opportunity to be here. We are just one of many community-based organizations to do this work. Yeah, Lisa mentioned uh, that we do this, uh, an assessment, and we analyze, you know, what are the key factors, underlying factors with the youth, and social disconnectedness is the number one factor we see across every youth that comes through the program. How does outdoor outreach deal with that issue in terms of lack of connection? Yeah, that's great. Um, you know, when we talk about 2020 and distance learning, um, I think the world got to see how disconnected you know, through a through a just Zoom meeting and and you know just social media, it, it, there's a disconnect, right? And I think that after that experience, you know, if we could say a good takeaway is that the value placed upon actual interaction, um, peer to peer support, mentorship and coaching, how important that is, and through this work, you know, it's. It's the challenge of, oh, you may not have been in the ocean before, you may not have swam before, you may not have been, you know, 30 feet up on a rock before, but the connection is that, not the act of doing, the connection is that you're challenging, you're, you're feeling yourself in this, like, vulnerable space along with everybody else, right? And sometimes it's not just the peers, sometimes it's their teacher, sometimes it's their social worker. Uh, so to be connected through that sense is a very real, tangible feeling, and it's a real connection, as well as connection to the outdoor space, right? A lot of our youth uh, may not have gone beyond just you know, a few blocks from their house or from their school, and so by taking them out to a canyon land, we don't have to go far. The City Heights canyons, right? A hike through that will introduce them to their neighborhood, and perhaps they might see something that they wanna change, and then empowering them to say, you, you can change this, you know? You can join a collective. You can speak out, your voice is heard. So, so much of this is, it's interconnected and it all builds. It builds upon the community. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thank you. So, uh, several years ago when we 
when the RFP came out for this project, our first reaction as an organization was to find like the two or three largest community-based organizations, and we'd all join together to apply for this contract. And uh, when we eventually had the contract, when I was talking to Lisa, she said, that's not at all the model that we're thinking about. And I just want you to explain that, because it's not about the largest community organizations. It's really more about place-based, more of the grassroots type organizations that we had talked about earlier today. Right. I mean, we have some amazing uh, community-based organizations in San Diego who do unbelievable work and are connected with all of our law enforcement, with the county, and are in there and working with these kids even before they touch the system, which is fantastic. And I know that they are here today, and I, and I really appreciate that. And then, But what we really wanted was, is we didn't want that traditional model. We are listening to community. That is what we have to do um, as the district attorney's office. We can't solve this problem alone. We need help. And so we listen to community. Community wants these kids in the community. The community knows best how to help their kids. So we want, you know, San Diego is a very diverse county. It's a very large geographic county. Um, we've got all different races, religions. They speak a lot of different languages. It's very different. And I can't presume to go into one community and do it one way and do the same thing in a different community. We need those individualized, culturally competent, grassroots organizations who understand their communities to participate in this, or we will not be successful. We will not help these kids. We will not make a difference. So we really wanted to make sure that you had an organization that would then take that funding and share it and push it down and uplift, just like we've been talking about all day long. How do we do that? We get those monies to the smaller grassroots organizations to help them build capacity, resilience, connect with the youth in their own communities. Because once they're done with the diversion program, and whether it's two, three, six months, we have to make sure that they are still connected. And the question was asked, what is success? Is it just recidivism? No. It is, did we leave that child better off and that family better off than when we first found them? And if we leave them and they're connected in some way, whether it's outdoor outreach or, it's, or they've got, they receive their behavioral health services they need or their educational advocacy or we're connected, or, or we're connected to some other one of our 100 linked organizations, then we're successful. And if they do come back and touch our system again, well, you know what? We may still send them back to diversion again. We have to look and see what it is. Just because they came back again doesn't mean they don't get a chance to go back to the JDI diversion program. So we look at all these different pieces. Um, so that was why it was very important to have community. It's integral in this, or it will not work, and we'll just be back in the same situation that we've been in for the last, what, 50, 100 years? Uh, Bria, can you give me a sense or give the audience a sense of the types of organizations that are, I mean, there's 40, 50 uh, partners and then even more linked organizations. Can you just give a sense of the types of organizations that are part of the program? Yes. So we have uh, mentoring. So we have individual mentoring and group mentoring partners. We obviously have mental health partners uh, down here and in North County. We have... Uh, skill building, so outdoor outreach. We have different um, athletics, so boxing is one of our most popular ones. Um, we have, I have notes on this because there's so many of them. David um, Yeah, we have decision-making courses in person and online. We have substance abuse treatment courses. We have, of course, educational advocacy, which is our number one rock star over there. Mm -hmm. um, we have family-based therapy, and we have apprenticeship um, opportunities. Mm -hmm. Great. So as you've been managing this program, uh, have you, what are some of the challenges? I mean, this is a really a new, relatively new program. We're just learning every day. I mean, what are some of the challenges that you've seen just getting this program off the ground? Yeah. So I think one of our major challenges has just been flying the plane while we're building it, right? So like you said, this is new. This is something that's different and unique. And so we're constantly learning and trying to adjust so that we can 
provide the best service to our youth and our families. And it's interesting because when the program was designed, who was at the table is not who's on the ground doing the work, right? And so on paper, the numbers look good. It sounds good. This is gonna work great. And then in practice, you start to see like, oh, this does not work, or we need to adjust this, we need to change this around. And so it's been really important to have direct and clear communication with everyone involved, all of our partners, the district attorney's office, and each other, just to be able to adjust and be open-minded because without that, we're not gonna be successful, right? If we're just stuck on, well, this is the design and this is how it's gonna be, it's never gonna work because we're out there, all of our kids and our families are individuals. So what works for one kid is not gonna work for the other kid. And so we have to be able to adjust that and move around that or else the program fails. And so that's definitely been difficult because you're constantly wanting to change and build and adjust, but you're constantly getting more kids, right? And so you never wanna turn any of the kids away, and so you're bringing in these kids, but you never wanna set them up to fail. So at the same time as you're advocating and like trying to work with these youth, you're also in 100 meetings a week, right? And you're discussing and you're like, okay, well, this is not working. I have five kids that don't wanna do this and we need to change it. And I need new mentors and I need more funding for the people harmed that are youth to be involved. And you're just constantly going back and forth and back and forth. And I think my team would say, you know, we were talking about this this week, like we're finally getting to a place that is starting to steady, right? We're starting to see, okay, all these negotiations, all the going back and forth, somebody's listening to us. Like it's finally starting to work and we're starting to really see like the fruits of our labor. And uh, what about from the Ray Children's Hospital? Are you seeing any barriers or challenges as you're implementing this program? Yeah. I think I would say some of the challenges that we face is more so not within the program, but as therapists and working with clients and their willingness to change and resistance to that and therapy overall. Um, we as social workers respect self-determination of a client and sometimes they're not ready to engage in our services or the conversation of what's happened, why they're coming to us, what's led them to the decisions that they've made. And so oftentimes, there are some barriers to getting kids to attend, and that's where the wonderful case managers come into place because they come and problem solve with us. They work really closely with the youth and their families to get them to services and to see what are the barriers to them engaging and really open, us, open up and trust us as providers who want to be there to support them and help them um, you know, and what, whatever it is that they're going through, I think that oftentimes we have to shift our perspective to remain trauma-informed for these children and to help them um, to see the different opportunities that they have, to see that they're not um, this label of, you know, delinquents or troubled youth. They have a story and they have gone through a lot of experiences generationally, um, or even just in their community. And so I think for us, it's really taking the time as clinicians to build rapport, um, to meet them where they are, um, to open our doors to them whenever they're ready, and just to take the time to be patient. And that's what we truly respect as um, mental health providers. And I think that, you know, we, again, we accept youth where they are, and we see the positive outcomes that really do come out of them engaging in therapy and being open to the opportunity to let us be there for them. What, what, do you, what is a technique to build trust? Like, how are you able to do that with a youth coming in who maybe is, uh, has faced trauma, he or she? Like, how do you overcome that barrier? I think um, it just really takes time. Um, we give them the time, we listen, we're non-judgmental. Um, we just are also respect like confidentiality of they all have their story, they all have an experience, and so we take our time. Um, I think oftentimes, you know, whether it's in a business or even as therapists, we think there's an agenda that we have going in, a treatment plan that we want to work towards, but we have to meet them where they are and kind of just take it day by day. Thank you. And uh, Sunny, what are your thoughts? Or have you come across any obstacles in your programming and outdoor outreach? Yeah, when I think about challenges, um, there's so many levels of it, right? And of course, much of it, as, as it does across the way, um, comes to fun funding and support. And I think Marquita was one that had mentioned something um, in the previous panel about 
there may be support or funding given towards the entity, and yet sometimes not the actual people at the ground level doing the work. And as an example of that would be, you know, we may, as a nonprofit, we sometimes will get uh, grant funding, but the grant funding is to do like, take X amount out to a certain space, but it's not funding towards supporting the staff and the folks that are on the ground level. So I think um, challenges would be just shifting that thought process of giving more resources and support to folks that are at the in the community at the ground level doing the work so that we make sure that case managers aren't overburdened with too many cases and that they can give each individual youth that proper support that um, you know we talk about prevention versus diversion prevention well you know outdoor outreach is involved besides NCRC and Rady Children's Hospital involved with several schools around the county. And when we talk about prevention, well, the teachers really are, you know, at that ground level too. And oftentimes they're so overburdened by just doing their job that they can't take the extra step in supporting the extracurriculars, right? And so um, we rely on a lot of that school support, whether it's at the principal level, to the teacher level, to like a, a student intern, um, to help support, to recruit the youth, to spread the word, and then to support the youth beyond the trips, right? Because it's not just the act of doing, it's the reflection piece at the end. Um, and then, so that's one of the challenges, it's kind of just kind of the support down at the ground level. The other additional challenge is then the, the addressing access. And so the organization has always been a part of um, advocacy towards opening up access, right? So our youth aren't gonna feel like they belong at the beach if one, they don't see any representation, but two, if they aren't made to feel welcome there. Like this isn't your neighborhood, you shouldn't be here. And so uh, we do address access to these places from transportation. Are, is there public transportation? Are there routes so that the youth can travel beyond their neighborhood? Um, is it safe to travel beyond their neighborhood? Um, you know, just all of these different elements of we want to see the youth in these spaces and yet are they able to get to those spaces? Do they feel welcome in these spaces? And so that would be a, a larger kind of broad challenge that, that we see. Uh, I mean, it's so interesting. You think of San Diego, we're just like this beach community, but there are so many youth that live in parts of San Diego County that have never mm -hmm. been to the ocean. And it, it's hard to even imagine that that's the case, but you know, yeah. sometimes, and why? Maybe it is because they don't feel comfortable there, they don't feel welcome, and that's something that you as an organization have to overcome that barrier. Uh, I'm also curious from the DA's uh, perspective, what were some of the obstacles that you faced setting up the program, designing it, and that you see in the early implementation of it? Um, it was changing mindsets, it really. You know, it's obviously the, the inherent distrust of government, district attorney's offices, prosecutors, law enforcement, um, when we really just wanted to um, work with community to try and um, help these youth. And I want to make sure that, that it's clear that, that this diversion program is pre-file. I mean, we are not filing charges on these kids. So if they're successful in JDI, we never file charges. They're successful. We send a note to the, D to the law enforcement saying uh, we will not be filing charges. They successfully completed this diversion program. So they don't even get into the system. And then their contact with law enforcement is sealed. So that's sealed for them so it doesn't follow them. So, so it was the, you know, it's just, it's trying to work through that, um, um, all that historical trauma that the community feels and trying to work with the community. And it just takes time in building that trust. They have to learn to trust us, um, that we're just trying to, to work with the youth. It, it's, it, it's difficult, but we are getting there. And um, I think that's working well. Um, also, you know, some of the challenges, we actually, it, people were very open in San Diego to this idea. We worked with, um, when we were setting it all up, we worked with the public defenders, um, office, they were very involved in all of this, with, with law, law enforcement was involved. Um, our Children's Initiative, which is a, a big organization here in San Diego that works with um, all programming for our youth was involved in it. Of course, Andy Casey Foundation. Um, so we really worked with a lot of different local um, 
and, and community to create the program. We wanted to make sure what we were creating was actually going to be helpful. You, we can't go out there and say, this is what we've created here, community, do it. That is absolutely not the way to do it. So we needed to build it together so that we made sure that, you know, I may have ideas that are um, not, that won't work, right? I mean, my experiences are different than other people's experiences. So we needed all those different um, lenses to come together in the room to create a program that would actually work. So. Um, and I don't think it was a that part was a challenge. It was actually a really wonderful experience working with everyone coming together to do that. Um, but some of the other challenges I think that we have are engaging, getting the families to engage. And uh, I mean, Bria, we talk about this all the time. It's, it's very hard for the families to get that trust, but they're working and doing a great, great job with that. So I think that's something. And also getting the victims or the persons harmed engaged in the restorative circles. That's hard as well. Um, so those are some of the things that we continue to work on and we're learning uh, on how to do that better together. I, I'm uh, curious also in San Diego, the DA, it's an elected position and I think in different jurisdictions across the country, sometimes it's an appointed position, other times elected. And uh, years ago when the model first came to San Diego, it came from Oakland. That was at the very beginning and I remember talking with the previous district attorney before uh, Summer Stefan, and she was saying, there is this model in Oakland, but San Diego is not Oakland. Uh, there's a different uh, constituency, it's different politics. You know, there's Northern California, there's Orange County, there's San Diego, and we have different types of limitations in our region versus possibly in the North. And I wonder if you see you know, politics, you know, like if that is at all a barrier in terms of, like in our electorate, you know, maybe people are thinking about accountability and consequences. And like I'm starting to hear even in the schools when we do restore practices in schools, the term restorative is starting to have a certain connotation that maybe some of the families feel was well, restorative. Is that the opposite of accountability? Does that does that not include consequences? So there's this uh, um, tension sometimes, I think, with the community versus uh, law enforcement and, and, and creating this type of paradigm shift. And so I'm wondering if, if you come across that in the DA's office. So yes, to some degree. But you know, you, when you have a, an elected DA at the top who has the courage to do what is right, then that's where it starts. You have a DA who has the courage to say, you know, this is what we now know. We know juvenile brain size. We know what works. We know what doesn't work. We know that the community needs to be involved. You know, at the DA's office, I don't want to go and put a kid into the juvenile justice system. That is not what I wake up in the morning to do. Um, I, have, I have two children. Um, I, I understand the dynamics of kids and, and their juvenile brain science. When I wake up in the morning, I want to make sure my community is safe, just like every one of you in here. And what does that look like? It's not charging a kid and putting them in custody. That, that is not what it looks like. Um, it, what it looks like is figuring out what that youth, that family needs, how can we appropriately address those needs and keep the community safe. Mm -hmm. And then we make the decisions on what are, what are the appropriate steps. So we are fortunate in San Diego that we have a DA who does have that courage. And so yes, do you get people that push back? We, we deal with victims every single day who say, I don't want this kid to go to the diversion. This kid should be in juvenile hall. And I say to them, well, this, this youth does not need to be in juvenile hall. This youth needs some services. I'm sorry that this happened to your child. Um, and we have to have those hard conversations. And they're, they're difficult conversations because if you know, your child was injured, you'd, want, you'd feel something. Um, but it's, it's not about, um, you know, accountability isn't always Punishment, accountability can be having the conversation and trying to restore the harm, talking it through, restorative circles, um, learning empathy, addressing whatever the, the underlying cause of those problems are. I mean, there's so many, we could talk about that for hours, but um, accountability means a lot of different things. And it's, it's, it's our office have taken the responsibility of talking to the community to say, this is what we really believe is the best and it's based in science and it's based in research and this is what's going to make our community safer. Mm -hmm. We have to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Um, when you say, uh, just for the, uh, the prosecutor, when you talk about the uh, 
juvenile program, did you survey the community to find out what they believe that youth that are engaging in negative behaviors, what those youth need, and then come back to the office, develop an RFQ, and then send that out to the community to say, okay, now, based on what you guys say the children need, who does in the community from a community perspective to deliver these services? Is that how you did it? Or? No, what we did was is that we worked with um, the Children's Initiative that is the one that kind of convenes a lot of our local community organizations, and we worked with them, and we sit, we're very collaborative here in San Diego. We meet with our big community-based organizations on a monthly basis. So we're very um, in tune with all the different services that are there. And we see and we learned about all of the different ones. So what we did is when we did the RFP, we were really, um, we gave a lot of latitude to the organizations to come to us and to create the program. We didn't say this is what the program had to be. We gave some parameters of what we, we thought the program ought to be. And we said, please build one and come back to us with what you think um, would be an appropriate program. And then they would come back to us, and they did. And then we came, would, would kind of go back and forth and say, well, we need some more information on how you're going to address the person's harm, or how are you going to address substance use disorders? How are you going to address? So we really kind of left that open, and then we allowed NCRC to then go back and reach out to the rest of these organizations in San Diego. They do an amazing job of the ho holding all of these when, I'm sorry, I'm not going to know what you call them. You, uh, you have these... Um, subcontractors? No, not subcontractors. You have, you have these um, engagement meetings all the time. Stakeholder meetings. Stakeholder meetings. I'm so sorry. Quarterly meetings. Quarterly meetings with all the different communities and to, to educate and to learn and listen, me, listening meetings. And then they come back to us and say... And the collaboratives. The collaboratives. There you go. That's what you... Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of meetings. <laughs> a lot of, so they have these collaboratives that come back with, the, okay, this would be DA's office, another organization we want to link with. And we're like... Yes, fantastic. Do you use MOUs to kind of uh, make the, all the governmental entities and the communities like coalesce together? Do you like all agree we're all going to do X, Y, and Z? So we, if we succeed, yes. we all succeed. But if we fail, we all have to share the burden. <laughs> if it didn't work, and go back to the drawing board. So we have our contract with NCRC. NCRC then has the MOUs and subcontracts. So we've really, the DA's office, we are not controlling it other than we've contracted with NCRC giving them the money, kind of told them this is our vision, and they're responsible. We don't want to be driving the train. We want to, we're trying to give the community back the control of this, of this process. You know, as the DA's office, all the cases come to us, and we say, here's the case. Because we have, you know, our decision is, do we file, or what do we do with it? And so we're looking at it going, well, I don't want to put this youth into the system. Here, NCRC, you work with them. So we really wanted to... I mean, I hope that it's coming across that we just, we gave community the decisions to make those things so that we're not, we don't have our fingers in the pie all the time. It's not, it's not how it should work. So did that answer that? Okay. You know, we, we were spending a lot of time this morning trying to define what community means. Is it, is it systems involved? Is it community led? Is it DA led? And uh, I think the program that we have in San Diego, it's this, very interesting sort of collaborative approach. And, and when there are issues, there are so many issues that come up. I mean, you mentioned about family involvement in the program. So, Bria, just explain how the types of meetings that you're having representing the organization with the DA's office on a continual basis. Yeah, so we're meeting with the DA's office Every single week, every morning. I think um, what she's saying is we're having too many meetings. <laughs> <laughs> we are going over, you know, the basics of the case. This kid's doing well. Um, we need more support for this youth. We need you to approve funding for the sister to come because the kid has anxiety and they won't show up without their sister, right? Like, even though they're not in trouble, but they still need services and help. And so those are the conversations that we're having to work through the kinks that we're seeing as we work with these families and we're bringing back the messages from our partners, right? So the partners are the ones that are really doing the work with the kids. And so when we're constantly in communication with the partners in the community and they're calling us up, right? And they're like, hey, you know, your kid is not showing up and I found out X, Y, and Z, then we have to all come together and figure out, okay, how do we have this kid be successful? What can we do for this kid? And sometimes we have to get the approval, right? Because we have to run it up the chain. So we're like, we need this. This partner said that they need this and we need to give it to them. How do we get it for them? And that's the conversations that we have to have with the DA team because 
they're the ones, like Lisa had mentioned, like they have the influence, right? One of our guys said that. The they money. have the influence, they have the money. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so sometimes that's what has to be done. Um, and so there's just a lot of conversation of, okay, well, we'll give you this, but like, how's it gonna work? Why is it gonna work? And then that's really a major part of my job is to just advocate for our kids and our partners and my team on like, well, this is why it's gonna work. We, we're doing it. We know it's gonna work. We know this is how it's gonna work. Or we tried it this way, it's not working. So let us try another way. And so those are just like the constant conversations that we're having every week, every other day, emails, phone calls. <laughs> I'm sure they get sick of us sometimes, but it is. This it is how we learn. I mean, we, we, we listen and we say, and, and Brio will come and say, well, we need um, this kind of, we, we have um, extra funding that um, if, if Bria says, well, we need transportation, we need, um, we provide, you know, they provide, we provide the money for the gift cards, for incentives once they complete different stages and once they complete the whole program and um, for like if a youth needs clothes or they need whatever they need, then the funding just has to be approved as a funding source. Other than that, and then Bria will come back to us and say, this is what we need in the why, and then those have to just be approved. But other than that, we are listening to the community to say, what is it that you need to be successful? Yeah, and we're listening to our kids, right? So when we bring them in, besides what the paper says on their referral, besides what the parents are saying, when we're sitting there one-on-one, -on -one, we're asking them, what is it gonna take for you to be successful? How are we gonna have you never do this again? How are you gonna move forward? And we wanna know what, what do they think that they need, right? Sometimes they're just, oh, I don't know. And we're like, okay, well, we'll figure it out. We'll pull it out of you. But sometimes they come in there and they're like, you know, I need transportation because my mom's never gonna drive me here. Okay, great, I'll pick you up. I'll have somebody else pick you up. We'll call you an Uber, we'll get you a bus pass. Whatever you need to get here to get it done, that's what we're gonna do. Some kids, you know, we see the parents day one, they sign the paper, and then that's it. We don't see them again, right? And so how do we now support this kid? How do we get them where they need to be, what they need, what they want with no parental support, right? And like, that becomes, hard because when you let them walk out the door, you don't know what's gonna happen. And so we're listening to the kids and to the partners who like, we have mentors. I, one of our mentors is sitting here. I'm like, I haven't heard from this kid. He's like, I'm gonna go knock on the door. Like, that's what we need. Everybody has to be on the same level with the same goal or else things fall apart. So uh, the reason I, I just bring that up is because I, I don't think it has to be necessarily an either or community versus systems partners. I think we can have a symbiotic relationship and there's knowledge and information and skill that like the district attorneys has so much knowledge. And then we as community have so much knowledge. And just a week ago, there was 15 of us on the call. I was counting, you know, from the DA's office, from the community working through a problem. And it was the ideas that you had, the ideas that we had where we could come together as a solution. So. I'm just wondering, as we move to the new paradigm, you know, what is community, and can we really work together, you know, to come to solutions? So I want to close the panel. Just if you have one or two words of um, what you aspire, inspiration, uh, I'd like to just start with uh, Sunny and go down the line of a couple words that you want to offer. Sure. Um, when I think bigger and I think where this work can, can, I'm so happy to already be seeing this work and all of the wonderful people here. I think that um, aspirations is to grow this beyond San Diego, to have this go, you know, international, international really, <laughs> but nationally um, and having key figures like Lisa, um, like Judge Hicks and Terry and probation, just having key figures, figures support this work and then have it all trickle down into the community base, the, the folks that are, are doing this. Um, just having that support and having that spread out because it's so important. This network of community is, is what will sustain this work. Yeah. Thank you, Sunny. Monica? I would similarly say that I think it's so, I mean, throughout the day we've seen so many different programs and it's beautiful to see all of these agencies work together and collaborate for really one goal and it's for our youth. And I think, you know, to do the work, we have to remember our why. Why did we all start this journey? Why did we all come into the field that we are in? And I think ultimately a lot of us here are for change and to see growth in our youth and the communities. And so I just, 
hope that we continue to collaborate and see um, a lot of lives changed. Uh, so I, I could, uh, we have seen a 30% decrease in our, in our juvenile petition filings once, since we started this. We are filing 30% less petitions. <laughs> so thank you. So we're really excited about the fact that that is a huge number of youth that are not going into our juvenile justice system. So it can work. So I really encourage um, other DA's offices, and I know we're working with NDAA to get it out to the other DA's offices across the nation, but it's really encouraging. So you guys all keep up the amazing work you're doing. Thank you. Bria, last word. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, just to reiterate, I really want to see this program grow and just expand, and I'd like to see funding just reallocated to these people that are doing the work, the mentors, the grassroots, uh, the mental health providers, the ones that are really just boots on the ground um, trying to make a difference with these youth and just expand. I mean, I know NCRC is working on a sister program for when our kiddos are done with JDI just so they can continue receiving services and they can just continue growing and being connected to their communities. So for me, that's always been a major goal of working with this organization. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists and our partners. <laughs>